Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Peter. Great to see you. Um, I'm Susan Spakowski, and I'm just introducing Peter today and introducing um, the connection between Peter and Alia. Uh, given, given the turnout, the sign-up for this webinar, I think many of the people on this call probably are familiar with Peter's work. Um, based in Boston, he's, the, he's a senior lecturer at MIT, um, founding chair of Society for Organizational Learning, and the founding member of Presencing Institute and the Academy for Systemic Change. Uh, I, I would imagine that many of you have at least one of Peter's books in your library. Twenty-four years ago, uh, the publication of the discipline was a major event for many of us. Um, this book right here. And not long after that, there were a number of, of field books that addressed different um, areas, domains, like schools that learn, and then we we had the necessary revolution and presencing, which led to some of the, um, the theory you work that many of us are also familiar with. So Peter's work has been hugely influential in the field of organizational change and systems and leadership, sustainability, education, um, all of these. And <clears throat> And I think that um, some of these books have become really classic texts in the field. So I first met Peter in 2001 at what was then called the Shambhala Institute. And um, there was a group of us, the founders of Shambhala Institute, which came to be known as Alia, who were here in Nova Scotia. And we were deeply immersed in meditation, mindfulness, Buddhism, and this vision called Shambhala, which was a vision for a secular expression of what some of the um, contemplative practices were pointing to, which was a deep experiential understanding of interdependence and the practices that support that. And, and a sense that that could be a foundation for society and for the institutions of society coming from that place and that understanding. But we didn't really know how to make that link, how to express that view in our, in our own daily work and life, let alone <clears throat> in some of the larger systems that some of us were working in. I was working in education, others were in business. So we were grappling with that, and we had a, a learning group that met for actually a couple of years. And some of you may know Michael Chender. He pulled that together in the beginning. And one of the key texts that we were looking at was was the fifth discipline. It was extremely um, resonant for us. And so at that time, uh, we reached out to Peter, and he we engaged in conversations, and he quickly became a friend, and he showed up at our first um, summer session in 2001. And that's, as I said, when I first met Peter. But that was the beginning, really, of a long relationship and friendship um, over the years and and um, through um, through all those years, Peter would show up and he would share his insights from his work and his global perspectives and um, and he would also introduce us to many of his friends and uh, through him we met. You can see some of the photos here on your screen. Fred Kaufman, some of you might be familiar with some of these. Some are not on the screen. Art Kleiner. Um, Otto Scharmer is there, you can see, Adam Kahane, and many others from the Seoul community. And there was a sense of a mutual journey as we were coming from different directions, but really meeting in this middle place of how the inner and outer practices of systems change and um, uh, complexity and and just how to be how to work more effectively in our in our lives and in our world. Um, all were coming together and evolving, and it was a, a wonderful journey to be on with you, Peter. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of your or your memories of that kind of meeting place. Well, other than having forgotten the exact year, it's a great it's a great reconstruction, and you're absolutely it's wonderful to just listen and be reminded. So I experienced Peter through all of that as just being 
having an amazing ability to hold the big picture and some of the frightening trends that he's been seeing before the rest of us were even really completely tuned into. Um, but to be able to hold that and at the same time a depth of compassion and humor and hopefulness, actually, it's been very inspiring. And um, his writings and his work have inspired many communities of practice, and he's been a support for lots of prototypes, um, been right there on the ground learning and sharing that learning, and continues to take systems thinking further and deeper as the years go on. Um, one of the prototypes is going to be shared at the upcoming Summer Leadership Intensive of Folia in um, Tacoma. So you'll hear more about that uh, a little bit later. So welcome again, Peter and everyone. And I'd like to invite uh, my colleague on the West Coast, Steve Byers, to just maybe guide us into this next part and set us up with some questions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you were very eloquent, Steve. <laughs> as, as, only, as only silence can be. Can be. Oh, dear. OK. <laughs> Uh, welcome, Peter. Uh, our flow for this morning is we're going to ask Peter to speak for about 20 minutes in response to some questions, and then we'll invite questions and comments from everyone, uh, all of our participants. So we'll move into the, the questions. We'll offer them to Peter all at once, and he can weave his responses uh, as he sees appropriate. So you've been involved with the Academy for Systemic Change uh, for uh, a good number of years now. And that is about developing the collective capacity for a scale that matters. So it would be helpful this morning if you would tell us something about the Academy, uh, why the approach to change is different that the Academy is developing, and why you think that this is the appropriate approach uh, at this point in time. Uh, next, uh, this idea of where to intervene in a complex system uh, in response to some complex challenge. We noticed that two areas of focus for the academy are education and marine ecosystems. So we're curious about why the academy has chosen to focus on these two areas. And then our last uh, inquiry is um, related to the fact that this work is hard work, and you've given it your attention for a long time. Where do you draw your inspiration? And what advice do you have for those of us who occasionally, if briefly, lose heart. Welcome, Peter. I thought you were going to say permanently lose heart. That's a, that's a different problem. Um, so, yeah, let me, uh, let me consider those questions as starters. Um, it, it really was fun listening to Susan kind of set the stage, and I asked her to take some time in doing that. You know, oftentimes there's such a rush to get to the person who's ever the featured person on these webinars, you kind of miss the context and flow. And there's a couple of things that Susan said that are as relevant today as they were uh, 13 years ago when we first met. Um, and I, I really appreciate that phrase Susan used about the secular expression of kind of ancient knowledge, I'll just say wisdom traditions. Uh, the Shambhala group coming out of a particular uh, aspect of, of Buddhism, um, but it's just one of a great many. And I do think that's something that, if anything, is more and more relevant. I don't think relevant is quite the right word there. I just say more and more uh, expressible today. I think when we were getting started, part of the question was, how much can we talk about this explicitly? I think that's a much simpler matter today. Uh, the, the problem there has always been the association of various, I'll just call them cultivation traditions, of which, of course, there are virtually an infinite number around the world, east and west, uh, developed world and indigenous and native world. There's so many cultivation traditions. Um, but today, I think it's a little easier to be explicit about that. Uh, the term mindfulness has been become almost uh, fashionable today, and that helps. Um, so, but it's a very simple idea, you know, and it was expressed, uh, I have a letter sitting here on my desk I keep as a reminder of a mentor for many, many, many years, a man named William O'Brien, um, and, and Bill was a 
uh, a marketing vice president and a CEO of an insurance company for about over 20 years from during which time it went from being bankrupt to being one of the top performing property and liability insurance companies in the United States which is very unusual that's actually quite a stable industry that does not have a lot of churn top to bottom um, and Bill reflecting on his personal leadership journey once said the he, he, he really felt that the most important determinant of the outcome of an intervention is the inner state of the intervener. Those were his words. The most important determinant of the outcome of an intervention is the inner state of the intervener. That turns out to be a very old idea. And like a lot of aspects of today where we face these really in many ways unprecedented challenges where we have all this technology that everybody thinks well that's all changing the world uh, all the amazing technologies and of course it's true to some degree a bit of the irony of the present is the necessity of going back as well as going forward to touching on some of the oldest ideas I think there's no uh, idea that's more associated with leadership historically and in traditions around the world than the idea of wisdom. But that's a word we don't hear much anymore. We don't use it much anymore. It's definitely out of fashion. We know a lot about knowledge and we know all about technology, uh, but we don't really talk much about wisdom. Well, the reason that idea has been around for thousands of years is exactly what Bill said. The inner state of the intervener, whoever is engaged in trying to help contribute to some meaningful change, where are they coming from? Not what can they do technically, not what can they even do, let's just say politically or organizationally, but what's their state of mind? Where are they coming from? So when Susan said that we were wrestling there back in 2001 with a secular expression of these wisdom traditions, I think that's now a little more on the surface. And I think it's as important today as it's ever been. The fact that it's a little more discussable is a is a really a good step forward. Um, the Academy for Systemic Change, which Steve was pointing out, um, been something that I've been associated with, is a is really not an organization. It's an initiative, and it's a an effort to foster collaboration amongst many many different networks. Uh, a, a body of work which I think is very important, maybe not quite as widely known, the immunity to change work of Bob Keegan and his colleagues, which really got started in education, but really is, is really about how institutions are enormously able to muster their immune systems in response to significant and meaningful and important change efforts. Um, appreciative inquiry, another uh, discipline that a lot of people know about. Um, these are all to me expressions of a common underlying awakening. We're all swimming in the same river and part of the challenge right now is to step back from our individual little canoes or rafts or whatever, <laughs> whatever metaphor you would like to use and really reflect on the river. And I think the river is exactly what Susan was talking about. This secular expression of the importance of awareness. We often use the term to characterize this larger movement, this emerging field, uh, awareness-based systemic change. It's a kind of a clunky phrase. I think it's, it's pretty accurate, if, it, if not very evocative. But where we're coming from matters enormously. I think that's um, really present in the world today in, the, in a way that it wasn't 10, 15 years ago. But to step back and point to it and say, hey, look, it, there's all these different expressions. Alia would be another. All these different canoes in the river. What's the nature of the river itself? And where is this river taking us? It's really important. And that's partly what we were after with this initiative of the Academy for Systemic Change. And, and the, the pragmatic front of that is pretty simple. I think we live in an era where there's an amazing variety of innovations occurring. 
you can think of anything you think really needs to be occurring in the world and you can find it. It is occurring. Uh, what's that old line? I think it's very apt today. Uh, the future is present today, it's just not very evenly distributed. Whether you're talking about education or business or the way that uh, civil society organizations work. Collaboration amongst all of the above. Uh, government, business, civil society, the cross-sector collaboration. Um, you can look at critical environmental issues, you can look at critical social issues. And, and my simple conclusion is in any of these domains what we need to see occurring in the world is already occurring. It's very important to recognize that. This movement is manifesting and it's manifesting in, in countless exemplars, living examples of what's needed. Connecting the inner and the outer, a phrase that Susan also used. The problem is it's not evenly distributed and it's a pocket here and it's an initiative here and it's a very exciting story over here. What we need to start to see is the story writ large that these initiatives start to grow to a scale commensurate with the scale of the problems. Because the other, to me, most telling ex uh, uh, aspect of our present situation is we really don't have a lot of time. Um, now that's always a subjective judgment. That's not a f statement of fact. You can make a lot of statements of fact in support of that conclusion. But I think it's a conclusion that a lot of us share. Um, We've often said, you know, climate destabilization is a sort of time clock. It's just a symptom. It's not the problem. It's a symptom of the destabilization of ecosystems and balancing, conserving processes that nature has spent several billion years evolving, and in particular the last few hundred million years evolving, so that a species like ours could actually prosper on a planet that would not have been very hospitable to it even a couple of billion years ago. Very inhospitable, but it's actually quite hospitable to us now. And the reason is there are a set of conditions having to do with water and soil conditions, obviously temperature and weather, pollination, a whole set of basic processes which have enabled this particular species over the last few hundred thousand years to really prosper, thrive and grow. There's only one small problem, this particular species, yeah, we're meddlers. Uh, Amory Lovins has a great way of expressing this. He said, we're nature's experiment to see if a large forebrain and opposable thumbs are a good idea in combination. Because we're tool users. Because of this opposable thumb, you, you could argue that the, uh, the dolphins, perhaps the whales, maybe several species, have every bit the cognitive capacity we have, but they evolved in water. They didn't evolve in land. They didn't evolve with opposable thumbs. They're not tool users. They're not manipulators. We are a manipulator as a species. For good or bad, you know, that's who we are. And obviously, quote, technology, all the tools we create are a manifestation of this. So this manipulating has allowed us to alter our environment so that our population has grown to uh, an extraordinary degree. There'll be um, close to 10 billion of us in all likelihood within 30 or 40 years. It doesn't seem like a lot until you go to uh, Shanghai or you go to uh, uh, one of the huge cities in Southeast Asia. Um, you go anywhere in China, anywhere in India, and you realize there's a lot of people on this planet in a way you don't usually experience actually in the United States. But it's not just a lot of us, it's an impact that we have. The human footprint by um, most estimates today vastly outstrips the carrying capacity of the planet. The typical number is about 1.5 somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5. That's the number of Earths that would be needed to support us at our present standard of living and material impact on the planet. And of course that's only an interesting number in concert with the fact that it'll be two 
very quickly. If China ever reached just China alone, the level of material affluence of the U.S., that would make it two. India would make it three. So it's not just we're at 1.3 or 1.5 now. We're on a trajectory that's going to take us and is taking us way beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. Uh, climate change, again, simple example. You've all heard this, you know, we must stop the world before it gets to be a two degree C world. Two degrees centigrade, global mean temperature above what it was at the beginning of the industrial age. Well, we're there now. If you look at the inertia in this system, in this global industrialization process, really, two degree C world is something we passed really probably 30 years ago, if you just consider the inertia, the almost unstoppable changes in the world today. But those are the kind of easiest ones to talk about because they're manifest, they're physical, they are understandable in with modern science, which is primarily a science focused on the manifest or the physical. Uh, in many ways, the more problematic are the social. We have a billion 300 million, 400 million, no one knows people today, and imminently 2 billion. So the number 2 will be 2 billion people living without reliable access to clean drinking water by 2020. That's just around the corner. I have a map I've shown on and off for the last couple years of China and India. Projection, if nothing changes, by 2030 with 3 billion people unable to meet their basic needs for clean drinking water. Roughly half the populations of those two countries will be unable to meet their needs for clean drinking water if things don't change. That's an extraordinary social imbalance and it just typifies the social imbalance that exists today. We could cite gazillions of statistics about the inequitable distribution of wealth and income. Um, and they're all symptoms of the social imbalance. But the third basic imbalance, and this is the way Otto Scharmer and Katrin Koifer, co-founders of the Presence Institute Network, frame it in their new book, which is an excellent one that came out last August. Um, they say there's three fundamental imbalances, the ecological imbalance, the social imbalance, and what they just call the spiritual imbalance, which is most manifest by the epidemic of stress and stress-related related diseases in the world, the developed world, our world, the world of plenty, the world of abundance, the world where the vast majority of people in our societies live with much more material well-being than actually they even need, yet are profoundly unhappy. So it's that third imbalance that kind of puts all the pieces together and says, you know, it really is about our inner state. Now the reason I rattled through all that is to kind of make another point about this big river, this emergent phenomenon. A part of the emergent phenomenon is this growing recognition that the, the nature of the problems we faced this are, are really harmonious with the nature of the solution that's needed. So you consider all three of those imbalances, all three of them will be reflected in the change processes. So they really will be about reconnecting with Mother Earth. They really will be about reconnecting with one another and social harmony, as the Chinese would put it. The current Chinese, not just the traditional Chinese. The number one kind of uh, theme again and again in China for the last two or three years from the party has been social harmony. Simple way to point at the fact that we've got to learn to live with one another, which is a huge problem today in China with the huge concentration of wealth that's developed. All the global problems in the world have all arisen in China in the last two to three decades, just like that. But then the third piece, this spiritual divide, this fact that we're not very happy, also points to, also to an aspect of the change person needed. They really will be about the inner and the outer. Where are we coming from? So. First off, it's time to see the river we're swimming in. It's time to step back and realize there is something deeper going on. If we can just recognize it, see it, it is the biggest single asset for all of us in our respective change projects. Um, 
at the uh, Summer Institute, they'll feature a simple example of this, which has been one that um, we've group we've worked with for many many years, both through the Soul Network and the Presence Institute. All these different networks kind of converged in several different points. Um, we believe that one of the areas that's critical to focus on in the world right now is the health of the oceans. There's two reasons for this. One of which characterizes a lot of problems. Uh, it's an acute issue that symbolizes the social and the ecological divide. Um, it's perhaps even a bigger consequence of our dependence on fossil fuels beside the destabilization of our global weather is the destruction of marine habitats through that acidification combined with local pollution combined with overfishing. But there's one other reason we've pointed to it. It's also a domain of extraordinary examples of what's needed. Today uh, by varying estimates, almost 80% of the fisheries along the Pacific coast of North America are being managed. They have quota systems. They have protected zones for the, for the breeding of whatever the respective species is. North of the Mexican border, 80% are now in some system of long-term management. That's a huge social accomplishment because it will never happen without leadership of the fishing communities. But if you go south of the border and you look around much of the world, including Europe actually, um, this is not the case. So there's a lot of examples of what's possible, but again, as I said before, far short of the scale needed. Probably 10 to 20 percent of the key fisheries in the world are either under some system of long-term management supported by the fishing communities and the local governments and the local businesses and obviously the marketplace that buys those foods. So there's a beautiful example of what's needed. Um, but it's still way too small relative to what's needed. In uh, the Summer Institute, Summer Intensive this year, uh, the Alia Summer Intensive in Ju June in, um, in, uh, in Seattle, there'll be um, a marine, one of the cases that we'll look at there will be a marine um, uh, social enterprise called NOS, Noreste Sustainabilidad, based in La Paz. Basically a bunch of marine biologists, you saw me struggling for even the term to use. You would call them an environmental NGO, except they're not. They've realized they can only restore fisheries in the, in the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California, which is about 80% of the, of the fishery production of Mexico. They can only restore those fisheries through leadership of the fishing communities. But the fishing communities are poor, quote, illiterate, you know, people who, you know, scientists will come in and tell them all the facts, and the scientists think, well, these people will never understand it. But, of course, it's not true at all. They really understand it intuitively because they've been living with these fisheries for a long time. But NOS is a great example of an environmental NGO who have become a social NGO. And a lot of their most impactful interventions has been to help the fishing community create alternative markets, to help them restore stability in their communities, to have some rule of order in their communities, which, of course, as you can imagine, are pretty chaotic without that, to help them start soccer teams so that they have something they're really focused on the well-being of their kids. Their first major intervention was helping the community build a soccer field, believe it or not. But it makes perfectly good sense when you realize the social and the environmental have to converge, but of course the third has to converge as well. People's sense of efficacy, their sense of identity, their confidence in who they are, and their community's well-being, spiritually, as well as materially. So I'm using this to illustrate the first big insight around change that we're all living today as we reflect on this deeper unfolding, is that these three have to come together. And that, in turn, defines the intervention processes. They always are anchored in self. They're anchored in networks, small groups of people who really transform the way we talk and work together. And with a larger intention to impact at a scale really relevant and beyond the reach 
of existing inf institutions. So if you look at how NOS has worked, they've collaborated with lots of other organizations because they had to build networks of collaboration whose scale, including government, including business, whose scale collectively was compatible with the restoration of these critical marine ecosystems. So that's kind of what we're all learning. Collaboration, focusing on the larger system, and the transformation of self and relationships in service of transforming larger systems. That's a quick thumbnail sketch of the emergent understanding. And I think this is probably a good time to pause and open it up. Steve? All right, I'm back. Um, we've had uh, one question uh, emerge uh, early on in your in your remarks. Someone was curious about the importance of the definition of the term authority in connection with leading. So the perhaps the difference between or the relationship sure. of authority and leadership. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, one of those areas that we always find in every practical setting. We've got to clarify, 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 and clarify. The two are different. Leadership ultimately has nothing to do with authority. Leadership, the actual word, means to step ahead, to step across the threshold from its historic roots and an Indo-European root, uh, often written lith, L-E-I-T-H. Um, and we all know in any complex system, you need leadership from many, many, many people, including many on the periphery, many well away from the seats of power. But you also need leadership from people who are in authority. So you can think of authority in, in ideally as a kind of a subset of leadership. People in positions of authority, it's very important that they can contribute leadership. The confusion though always comes in the way we use the word. Because we use the word the leaders to talk about the people in position of authority. We always have to remember whenever we do that, we're literally saying that all the rest of you folks and all the rest of us folks, we're not leaders. So we always just say, look, at, let's put an adjective there. If you're talking about executive leadership, use that. If you're talking about leadership from the government, talk about governmental leadership. If you're talking about leadership from business CEOs, let's just talk about business leadership. But you're also talking about leadership from the community. Let's, let's talk about community leadership. So I think the problem is solved at some very simple level just by using adjectives. But it all starts from recognizing that leadership is the capacity of people to shape their future, individually and collectively. It's the simplest definition. I know it's the one that's always worked for us. And it is a much bigger concept than authority. But authority matters. Uh, another question that comes up uh, with respect to the, um, I guess, the subtitle of these webinars, Tools for Transformation, what are some specific tools um, that you think hold particular promise uh, in this new context? Well, today, one of uh, uh, an abundance. There's so many tools. Um, I really emphasized in my comments at the outset where the tool user is coming from. Because in, in the hands of a person or a group who really is continually examining their own inner state, their own motivations, their own emotions, anger will undermine the best of tools. The best of tools used in a state of anger, victimization, they're doing it to us, will just produce more of the same. That said, the Society for Organization Learning, the Presencing Institute, the Appreciative Inquiry Network, uh, the Immunity to Change, the four I named before, all have an abundance of tools. Okay, I mean, we don't need to talk about all the field books. Susan mentioned them. They're very practical. They have been produced through the Soul Network, systems thinking tools, um, working with mental models tools, tools for promoting dialogue. I frankly think the Presencing Institute website is the best website out there right now in terms of an access to a whole set of tools having to do with Theory U. So anybody who's really serious about this work has an abundance of tools to go to. Mm -hmm. So first off, just knowing where they are and how to find them is, is very important. But then, you know, you come back to this very simple, basic truism. The tool doesn't transform. Tool users transform. 
Tools are just mm -hmm. means. They're just ways of getting something done. You need those. Without good tools, you don't build many houses. But hammers don't only build houses, they build carpenters. So it's this dual emphasis on the practical use of the tool and the developmental use of the tool that's key for making the tools effective. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got another one here. It says, uh, I'm very curious about how we might connect the various initiatives around, say, education, for example, uh, so that we could share information and learnings on a global scale. So this idea of, of connecting all these uh, right. smaller efforts that are underway. Right. So uh, that is actually one of the particular focuses within the academy, again, because our, our kind of uh, project, our initiative is about connecting and leveraging all the wonderful work that's going on and we've identified a few domains where we think there's so much promise for this and, and education is one of them and I mean particularly now the education that really is fundamental worldwide for everybody which is primary and secondary education not just university education. In some sense I think university education is a different critter. It, it, it kind of is happening already and you've got all these MOOCs going, being created all around the world now, which will undoubtedly serve to connect people at that level. The problem is, really though, it's the beginning of the education journey that puts most people off course. Hmm. The industrial age school was never about developing human beings. It was about training factory workers. And if you look at it closely, it hadn't changed a heck of a lot. So yes, we need to learn how to connect innovators in primary and secondary education around the world. I'm confident that's going to happen more and more. But connect them to do what? Okay? Um, the most logical thing, the thing that tends to happen most readily, is connect people to do what we're already doing in industrial age schools. You know, you can visit schools in China where I spend about a month a year or visit them at any place in the developed world. It doesn't really matter. It's all the same school system. And the people have the exact same complaints. Stress, overwork, mm -hmm. disengagement. Kids are bored with school every place in the world. And we can say, well, the answer to that is we're going to have all these wonderful, sexy stuff online, and then school will become more like a bunch of games. No, I don't think that's the answer. Because that's not particularly developmental either. It just hooks kids emotionally. You know, it can be a lot like, you know, salts and sugars, you know, hooking them, you know, physiologically and emotionally. Um, no, the, the, what really needs to engage children is their own journey of learning, their own deeper development. It's what great teachers have always done. So we need to have a kind of revolution in our vision for education that is um, parallel with a revolution in the delivery system. The delivery system is going to be revolutionized, but I think you see very meaningful cracks in the egg here in the sense that a lot of people think, oh, well, technology will just replace school. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. Technology shouldn't replace teachers because school at its best is about the social aspects of learning. It's not just a cognitive, personal process. It's a developmental process, which means it's cognitive, emotional, social, spiritual. And I see no nothing attractive in kids not learning with and from one another, not building different qualities of relationships with adults, which is very, very important part of the developmental journey of students. Will all this be enabled by technology? For sure. So I think the MOOC phenomenon, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, certainly those in education, these massively open online courses, is great. We're, we've got a partnership with the MIT office that's been most involved with this for the longest time now. And it's interesting, the uh, Pakistani man who's the professor and head of that group at, uh, at MIT says, you know, everybody thinks it's one to many. You know, this is how one great lecture in chemistry is going to reach 100,000 students, which will happen, is happening. He said, but the real phenomenon becomes many to many, how communities of students learning chemistry start helping one another. We have projects in our network of people who have teachers who have brought about amazing innovations in a classroom. Imagine a group of kids teaching each other algebra. I've seen it. It does happen because of fundamental shift in vision for how a classroom can work. 
and how the social, emotional, and cognitive can really blend. So you learn algebra, helping one another learn algebra. This is an example of the kind of deep revolution in the vision of education. So I think education is a key system because clearly it's the first system. Mm -hmm. It's the first system all of us encounter. It's our kind of training ground in industrial age institutions. Unfortunately, it's trained people to be more competitive, more driven by their own goals, less focused on each other, less focused on the well-being of their community, and less focused on the well-being of how humans live in the natural world. But every kid knows that's actually the challenges they will face in their lifetime. So um, I, I think platforms that enable this, these levels of collaboration will start to come about. But the roots for this will be real, profound, transformation in pedagogy and instructional design then brought to a larger scale. That's the type of networks we're trying to help encourage and they are going on around the world. There's a meeting in Spain going on right now with leaders of social emotional learning from around the world. It's a phenomenon that is actually global right now. How they get connected, how we leverage their efforts is exactly what we're trying to do through the academy. But it's not just us. A lot of people are trying to do this. So I think that's where we need to put our attention. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and actually, that's a, a good segue to, well, there are many questions flowing in here. I'm going to combine a couple. Um, one has to do with how we work with the inner transformation and the outer intervention effectively, uh, such as the example with local communities and the fishermen. And then the, the parallel question is about practices uh, that would be helpful in developing that inner state of the intervener. And even further, this question asks, what are some of your personal practices? No, I appreciate that. That's, uh, that's, that's the territory that we all need to get into. So the first thing is kind of obvious. Um, any of us trying to be more effective individually in this work need practices. Again, this is not a problem of, of, of any kind of uh, shortage or deficit. You know, there, there's literally an infinite array of cultivation practices. You know, find one, do it, do it diligently. Uh, I was uh, first introduced to uh, to Zen when I was in college, and I really, uh, I really, you know, liked it. I really liked the sitting practice, and I did it on and off for about 25 years, and then through one serendipitous connection and another. I managed to find a teacher in China, which was not very convenient, uh, who said, "Okay, I understand you've been doing meditation for a long time." I said, yeah, yeah. He said, "When?" He said, "I said well, when I feel like." And he said, "Well, if you're serious, you better start doing it every day." So at that point, I did. Um, and so it's not about the particulars of the practice; it's finding something that works for you. It's really about getting serious, you know, not when it feels good, but really seeing it gradually. I would say, for me, my cultivation practice becomes the heart of my life. Everything kind of revolves around that. And, you know, when I travel, it uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the convenience. I can always find an extra hour or two to do my practice, and I do. Um, by the way, it really helps with jet lag. It makes a huge difference. Um, <laughs> you also need collective practices. So at the heart of every transformative initiative will be some group of people. We often call them the container builders. They see their job as building a container, which we found to be a very powerful image for the nuts and bolts of what allows deep transformative change to occur. Some group of people, it could be as few as three to five initially, are building that container. Now, how do they do that? They do that through some collective practice. It may be sitting together quietly. It may be really being diligent about check-ins. We found the ladder of inference, one of the core tools from the organizational learning work and the mental models, part of that, um, as a foundational practice, how a group of people become disciplined at distinguishing their beliefs, their interpretations, their assumptions, their conclusions from what they actually experience. So that when the conflict arises, somebody can really say, hey, Fred, you know, that's a really interesting idea. What led you to that idea? Mm -hmm. Rather than arguing about the idea, you come down the ladder to say, well, here's what I experienced. And here's the reasoning process I went through to draw my conclusions. And somebody said, oh, that's interesting. I experienced something different. Or I went through a different reasoning process. It's a real discipline 
I think, quite analogous to what good scientists use in focusing on data and focusing on our experience, distinguishing those and connecting them together. I'm just using this to illustrate. The group that builds a container has to have some collective practices that allow them collectively to deal with their own conflicts, to stabilize their own awareness individually and collectively, and to deal with the challenges that will confront them. If you look carefully at initiatives that go awry, change efforts that fall apart, I guarantee you there's a group that falls apart at the heart. They start bickering, they stop coming down the ladder of inference, they stop grounding their, their inquiry uh, in, in what they actually experience, they become polarized, and then that manifests in the larger effort. Obviously, you're gradually trying to integrate practices into the larger efforts as well. And this is where you know, Theory U has been extremely helpful for all of us. In large cross-sector initiatives that we undertake, we found organizing them, um, we imagine you have people from business and government and civil society trying to work together. That's been a focus of ours for the last uh, 10 years. And the initial project that has really had legs in all that is called the Global Sustainable Food Laboratory. You can Google that, Global Food Lab. Um, and you'll find this group that's been together for 10 years. It now involves over 70 of the world's largest food companies and NGOs, about a 50-50 mix all working together to bring sustainable agriculture into the mainstream. If you look at collectively in that network, you'll find practices. Whenever they have a meeting, they do learning journeys, one of the basic Theory U practices. They go and visit farmers together. NGOs and business people go to the local farming system, wherever they are. Developed world, underdeveloped world, doesn't matter. And they hang out with the farmers. They find it not only gets them grounded in the reality of the food system where they're gathering, but it also is a reflective process when done well. And there's a very good description of how to do this well on the Presencing Institute website. It grounds them in saying, hey, here's a social justice NGO person. Here's this environmental NGO person. Here's this corporate guy. They see something completely different, which is exactly yeah. what happens. And how do they actually bring out into the open the differences in what they experience in a way that they start to get a larger and more comprehensive reality of their learning journey to those farmers. It becomes a common practice that you'll see moving throughout this whole huge network today of thousands and thousands of people in all these different organizations working on a shared vision of making sustainable agriculture the mainstream system. So you need practices individually within core teams and within larger networks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I want to invite a pause here uh, for just a moment and first to just acknowledge uh, that there are many uh, excellent questions that we're not going to be able to get to. The, the flow has just been impossible to keep up with here. Uh, there is one that, um, that maybe you could ponder uh, for a moment while I do the uh, uh, conclude the webinar with some information that we need to share and that would be uh, how do we or how can people get involved in the Academy? And is it possible for others to be involved um, and maybe that includes coming to the Summer Leadership Institute, maybe not, uh, but maybe there are other ways of, of becoming involved. So uh, let me go to a couple of other slides and then we'll come back to you for the uh, closing remarks and uh, that will be the conclusion of the webinar. webinar. So we need to talk a little bit about uh, what's coming up and we wanted to well, first share some information. Um, Peter mentioned several times, of course, the Society for Organizational Learning. And there actually is a, a workshop coming up uh, sponsored by uh, Seoul featuring Peter Senge and Darcy Winslow. And this is in uh, mid-June, 18th through 20th. And I presume that's in Boston, Peter? Yes. Yeah. Boston. And uh, that website there, you can uh, find more information about that. And we also want to mention the upcoming uh, webinars uh, in this series, Tools for Transformation. And we have at the moment three left. I, I suppose there is a possibility of others. But the next one coming up is Adam Kahane on April 16th. And you can register for that. And this will feature Adam talking about his uh, latest book, uh, Transformative Scenario Planning. Following that will be Bob Stilger talking about his uh, 
uh, adventures and experience in Japan since the earthquake and nuclear disaster several years ago. Mm -hmm. And then Art Kleiner uh, will talk about uh, his work around collective mastery and organizations. And speaking of Summer Leadership Institute, uh, this, this uh, or Summer Leadership Intensive, this is going to be uh, such a wonderful experience. And here are some of the folks that will be present. Uh, you can see the entire list on the website. But we have Charles Eisenstein, uh, who has authored a book, Sacred Economics. Uh, Mayan Canute, who is from the Kafunda, Kafunda Learning Village mm. and who is a, a, a longtime Alia participant and host and designer and just uh, always present. Uh, Dan Siegel will be with us virtually, uh, Barbara Cecil and Art Kleiner, as well as our uh, Shambhala arts team. And you can see uh, Barbara Bash and uh, uh, Jerry Grinelli there uh, in that photograph. So that's uh, in Tacoma, Washington, uh, near Seattle, June 8th through 13th. Uh, and you can register uh, on the website. I think that is our, oh, and just to uh, go a little bit deeper into the uh, Summer Leadership Intensive, Darcy Winslow uh, will be there uh, as well, and she and Charles Holmes are going to present a, uh, a case study, a story about community transformation through awareness-based systemic change. And we're very excited to have uh, this combination uh, working together and that is, this is just one of the numerous stories that people will be able to um, participate in that week. Okay, back to you, Peter. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, you're right. One way to uh, learn a little more about the work of the Academy, again, it's not an organization, it's an initiative. And another way to say this is, you know, being part of the initiative. You know, I think all of us as change leaders naturally have a lot of energy and focus on our own projects and initiatives. That's as it should be. The problem is how do we maintain, you might say, our peripheral awareness? So we really are continually reflecting on how are we part of this larger river? How do we build networks of collaboration that across many of these different change initiatives? Um, so that's what the academy was created to draw attention to <clears throat> the timeliness today of leveraging and connecting across multiple change initiatives. So Darcy Winslow is a kind of coordinator of the academy effort. She was the person at Nike. We worked together for many, many years who really led all the historic work that Nike did in sustainability, which has continued now into a second and third generation of leadership since she's retired. Um, and, and the scale of it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, and Charles will, Charles Holmes, who's from Vancouver, a consultant in organizational learning from Vancouver, will be joined there by some of the people from that um, Mexican uh, environmental NGO called NOS that I was talking about earlier and sharing that particular case uh, and that story as an example of the opportunity to really focus on this restoration of critical marine ecosystems at a scale that really matters around the world. So that's the idea. And I think you can read about it at the Academy. It's not a membership society. Again, it's not an organization. Uh, the, 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 the networks that we kind of grow out of, Seoul, Presence Against Institute, they're easy to get connected with. Okay, again, I think the Presence Against Institute website is, is terrific that way. They do a lot of online programs. Um, I think more sharing this common intention that we're at a point right now, I would say this decade, in fact when we started the Academy we said it's a 10 year project after 10 years it's over and we're about three years into it now. Um, this decade we need to start to kind of crack the code, transform our consciousness particularly around this imperative of connecting and leveraging. I'm not alone. What I do is important, but it's just one small drop in a very large bucket. But there's a lot of drops occurring in that bucket. How do I hold them in my consciousness? How do I feel my connectedness with others doing what I'm doing? How, when the opportunity presents itself, rather than following the thread of our habitual mindset, which is to compete, 
Remember what I said before about school. All of us who did well in school did so because we learned how to compete, to be, to be better then. How do I not just kind of honor that habitual thread of my, of my, of my conscious, but really cultivate the thread of collaborate, support, make the other a little more important than me, make that other organization more successful. There are school systems in California now trying to learn how to help each other. This has never happened before. It's very difficult. They're struggling. But the intention, the recognition that if we don't help one another, the, even the best school systems, and there's always a few that are much better than others, are just, again, a drop in a bucket. We're not filling the bucket. So how we begin to keep holding in our awareness that our job is to fill this bucket, to create a scale of change in the world that's commensurate with the problems. If you keep holding that question, you're part of the academy. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it's been a, a great pleasure to see you today and to, to uh, interact with you. I know everyone is uh, very appreciative of you taking the time to, to be with us. My pleasure. And, uh, Look forward to the next opportunity to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.